All right, the title of the sermon this morning is Fight the Good Fight of Faith. Fight the Good Fight. So, you know, we have fought a good fight here at this church for seven years, but, you know, it's only just the beginning. It's not over yet. You know, there's a saying that I heard, you know, in Christian churches that, you know, Christianity, it's not measured in years, it's measured in decades because it's a lifelong pursuit, isn't it? It's something that we could, should constantly be striving for. We want to strive to be, be fighting the good fight all the way unto the end. So I want to encourage you today to join the fight, maybe rejoin the fight, <laughs> or keep on fighting the good fight. You know, there's three types of Christians, isn't there? There's three types of Christians. One is those that are in the fight, Christians that are in the fight. What's another type of Christian? Another type of Christian are those that are just watching the fight. They know a fight's going on, but they're not in the fight. They're just watching the fight. They know a fight's happening, but they're just observing. And then the third type of Christian is the Christian that is sleeping. They don't even know a fight is happening. But we are in a fight. We need to get in the fight. And hopefully this sermon today encourages you to be in the fight. So that's my first point. My first point is, be in the fight. There is a fight going on. We see there in 1 Timothy 6, as we read from the chapter this morning, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we're in a fight. And, it's, and, and one thing I just wanted to point out here is what does it mean to lay hold on eternal life? Lay hold on eternal life. Now what I believe it means in this passage, in the context of this passage, is it's the difference between having your focus on the temporary and the temporary riches of this world versus laying up treasures in heaven. You'll notice that it's linked into fighting the good fight is contrasted with, hey, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not to, you know, this is not what life is about. Life is not about just the here and now, the being comfortable, laying up riches like the rich fool. You remember the rich fool? They just laid up all his food and he's like, oh, I ran out of places to store my goods. What am I going to do? I'm going to build bigger barns and just store up more, right? Well, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is laying hold on eternal life, having that eternal perspective where we think, hey, I want to lay up treasure in heaven rather than just hoarding all my wealth. Now, how can I use the wealth, the material possessions, the time that I have to lay up treasure in heaven and do things of eternal value? Right? That's what it means to lay hold on eternal life. How do I know that? Because when you go further down the chapter, 1 Timothy 6, 17, look at this. Charge them that are rich in this world. You know, sometimes we read a passage like this and we're like, well, I'm not rich. And you know, compared to most of the people in the world, we are rich. Right? So don't think that a passage like this does not apply to you just because you're not on like some six, seven figure salary. You know, you have clothes on your back, you have a place to live. I mean, we have food, you know, in our pantries that could probably last us for a few weeks. There are people in the world that do not have the prosperity that we have, right? And, you know, it's something to keep in mind when we read a passage like this. Let me make sure these are turned on. They turn, they turn off automatically after two hours while you dwell on that verse. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Look at this. That they do good, that they be rich in good works. Right? So he's saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with being rich, even prior in the verse we read before. There's nothing wrong with money in and of itself. Money is a tool. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And he's saying here, yeah, there are people that are rich in the world. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but what he's saying here is, hey, if you're rich, don't trust in these riches. He says, hey, do good with those riches. Be rich in good works, ready to distribute. What does that mean? Generous with what you have. 
willing to communicate. So communicate there does not mean just you know, conversation, speaking. Communicate in the Bible is when they would send you know, their money over. And commun- like when Paul says, you, know, you communicated with me, is that they actually supported his work there. Look, laying up in store for themselves, isn't that familiar? To lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. Look at this. That they may lay hold on eternal life. So you see, that's what lay hold on eternal means. You have that eternal perspective, that you're thinking about eternity. Right? And you need to have that eternal perspective to get in this fight because it's a fight of spiritual things. It's a fight for eternal souls, isn't it? So be in the fight. We are in a fight. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Right here in verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Don't be sleeping. Don't be spiritually asleep. And spiritually asleep doesn't mean you're not doing anything. Spiritually asleep means you just care about the things of this world. You're laying up treasures upon earth. Because you may be busy in your life. That doesn't mean you're fighting the good fight of faith. Right? So some people, they get busy in life. But what are they, what's in their heart? Are they just serving themselves? Are they just busy because they want an easy retirement? Are they just busy because they're serving man? Are they busy just because they're serving themselves and how man looks at them? Right? This is not what life is about. Life is about the eternal. So when you fight the good fight of faith, you have that eternal perspective, you're going to lay hold on eternal life, and you realize that your true riches are not the riches you have on this earth, but the ones that you lay up in heaven. So this fight that we're in, it's not a physical fight. Look at what Jesus says in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now, what I don't think this means is that there is never a time to fight physically. What what, what we're talking about here is that we're not fighting a physical fight because in order to further the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we're not fighting a physical war. Like We're not actually going, taking up arms, you know, like Russia's doing now, right? Taking up arms, going into Ukraine, trying to, you know, extend their borders, you know. Whoever's right in this, in this instance, I know there's two sides of the story. I don't really care who's right. I think Australia should not be involved, full stop. But that's what happens in this world. What happens in this world is that people take up arms, they fight that physical fight. What Jesus is saying here, well, then, you know, his kingdom is not of this world. It's not this physical kingdom. The fight is a spiritual fight. And that doesn't mean there's never a time to fight, right? There's a, there's a reason that countries have defenses because if you're ever attacked or you're invaded, you need to be able to defend yourself. So there is a time for war and there is a time to stand up and fight. But that's not how we further. That's how we may protect the interests of Australia. That's how we may protect our private property. But that's not how we further the kingdom of God, right? So it's not a physical fight to further the kingdom of God. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, it's not this physical fight. It's a spiritual fight. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there is a fight that is going on. It is a spiritual fight. We need to get in that fight, right, as Christians. There's not a lot of soldiers in, you know, churches in the Christian world, right? So those of us who are awake, who know what's going on, who understand the truth, we need to get involved in this fight. That's my first point. So there's a fight going on. Make sure you are in the fight. Number two, in this spiritual fight, you want to make sure that you're effective, that you're an effective soldier. What are some things that are going, to, are, are going to make you less effective as a soldier of Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 20. And this is a very interesting passage. Uh, I had somebody, uh, I was talking to somebody recently, and they were asking me uh, you know, what I thought about conscription. You know, is it right? 
that you know countries you know against the will of somebody conscript them into the army force them to fight and i thought of this passage at the time thinking you know i don't think god would be for conscription showing like you know what he's what he how he deals with the army here in deuteronomy 20 let's read it and we'll talk through some points deuteronomy 20 verse 1 when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou be not afraid of them for the lord thy god is with thee which brought thee up out of the land of egypt and it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them hear o israel ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies let not your hearts faint fear not and do not tremble neither be ye terrified because of them for the lord your god is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you so we can learn the reason why we're going to this passage as well is that we can learn a lot of things about the spiritual fight and how we can apply them just from physical war itself and just like god is saying here that god is going to be the one that goes to fight for you um you know it's very interesting there that we use the word of god and we defend the word of god and we use the word of god in this spiritual war which is a war of information right it's a war of words and you know oftentimes you know that's that's how we win these arguments right how we how we attack and we defend is because we're using the word of god and we're explaining the word of god and it's the things taught in the word of god that ultimately moves people's heart so it's interesting here that you know also in times of war god is saying hey i'm going to be the one that goes and fights for you and that can be applied to the spiritual war as well and the officers shall speak verse 5 unto the people saying what man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it let him go and return to his house lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate and what man is he what and what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it let him also go and return unto his house lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it and what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her let him go and return unto his house lest he die in the battle and another man take her and the officers shall speak further unto the people and they shall say what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted let him go and return unto his house lest his brother lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart and it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people so after they give these instructions to the army and after people have had a chance if they want to stay or go they go then they assemble themselves uh, I think there. I wonder if it's they assemble themselves after they've kind of whittled the crowd down because you don't want to necessarily put somebody in charge that then decides, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be here, right? But then they stay because they've been appointed as a captain as opposed to appoint those that are willing to fight and have the bravery and the courage to be captains of these armies. So, what are some points that we can see here in Deuteronomy 20 that we should be aware of? in the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in well first let's look at deuteronomy 20 verse 1 it says here when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou be not afraid of them so first i just want to say that you know quality matters more over quantity in the christian life sometimes people think oh we just get more people more people more people but you know what another way you can go about it is if we just increase the quality of the people that we do have right if each one of us grow each one of us is passionate about the battle it doesn't matter if there are people more than us i mean look at this these instructions i mean we we read through the instructions given to the nation of israel how to whittle down the army of people that are scared and all that and and god is saying here that the situation is already when there are more of them than you <laughs> so even though there are more of them than us god's still saying hey you know we need to you know be brave and we need people that are not you know uh, thinking about the things of this world and all that that's what's more important and it makes me think about so like i said about the russian ukraine uh, conflict it just makes me think about this because we're, we're you know talking about fighting and like i said i don't care who's really right in all of them i'm, I'm quite against uh you know war but one thing i think about in that conflict 
is, you know, what, what, what we know about on the media. And what, do we even know what's true? So I don't know how this point will even stand, but let's assume for a second that what we're, what we're hearing on the media is true. One thing that strikes me and what I can relate to in this particular point here is that everyone thought, oh, you know, Russia, so big, so strong, and U Ukraine was a much smaller nation. But you notice how, you know, Ukraine were fighting for something that they believed in, you know, they were fighting for their families, fighting for their freedom, and even though there were less of them, they inflicted a lot more pain onto the Russian armies where people were just conscripted into a cause that they may not have agreed with. So I just thought that, that you could see that play out even in the real world, where people, where the quality matters over the quantity. Because if you have a small number of people activated, passionate, you know, they know, they believe in what they're fighting for, hey, they're, that, they're going to be a lot more effective soldier than the person that's just half-hearted. So, you know, we don't want to be like that half-hearted person that half-hearted soldier where our heart's not really in it because we're going to diminish the effectiveness of God's army because the fight is happening whether you're in it or not. You know, if you get in the fight, you're an effective soldier, you're just going to help this battle that we're in. But if you don't, then you're a detriment to this war that we find ourselves in. So it's quality, not quantity. What's another factor that we see here in Deuteronomy 20? The officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated? Let him go, return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. So this ties into this idea of laying hold on eternal life. Not, not being you know, distracted or carried away with the things of this world, the riches and the cares and the pleasures of this life, but having you know, your heart set on this battle. So in this example here in Deuteronomy 20, it was a detriment to the army if the soldiers were too distracted with the things of this world, that their heart wasn't fully in the fight. What are the examples we're given here? Somebody who's built a house, right? They made an investment. Got a lot of material possessions. They built a house... They haven't dedicated it. What's that? They, they built a house, they haven't had the chance to enjoy it, so their heart's still there. Because that's what happens when you get shiny new things, don't you? When you first get it, you care a lot about it. You think about when you get a new car, or you get a new house, everything's neat and tidy. You know, people do a renovation in their house, they care first of all, you know, where everything is, don't get things dirty, oh, don't scratch that, oh, careful, don't no, sit there, you're going to ruin the leather, whatever. But then what happens after a few years? You start not to care, it becomes normal. Right, so, you know, this is, this is a real thing that happens. And he's saying, hey, you've got these new things. You've just planted a vineyard. You've started a business. Your heart is there. Your heart is not in the fight. These are things we have to be aware of, that we don't entangle ourselves too much with the affairs of this life. Look what it says here in 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You see there? So we've got to be careful with the thorns of this world. You know, in the parable of the soul, the thorns were the riches, the pleasures of this life, the cares of this world. And I don't think it is um, a coincidence that when God talks about fighting this fight and being entangled with the affairs of this life, it's like those thorns that choke the word that it becomes unfruitful, that word that is in your heart. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of, you know, the finances in our life that can distract us from this spiritual fight. Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. What man is there that hath betrothed the wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. What is this thing we have to be aware of? In Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. And we can apply it to the spiritual fight. Well, it's family in our life. In this example... It's particularly a wife, you know, so you could apply it to husband as well. But family in general, you know, the relationships in our life that affect our impact, our effectiveness. You know, and obviously marriage is one of the ones that is most impactful because it's the closest relationship there is. We have to be very careful with who we choose to marry. And we have to take care of that marriage so that marriage pleases God and you're serving together what, rather than taking away from one another because it's, it's very possible. But, you know, it's also family. A lot of people, people put family over God. 
You know, they put family events over the things of God. You know, they, um, you know, they, they, um, you know, just like I said, they don't do not have their priorities right. God should always be first, and then family second, right, and then yourself last. So we need to be aware of these things. Look at First Corinthians seven. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So this verse is not teaching that it's wrong to be married, right? It's just that when you're married, obviously you have other things to worry about, other, other cares that you have to worry about. And we want to make sure that those cares that are, you know, spiritually responsible, that we make sure that it does not overshadow putting God first, which sometimes happens. And, you know, I've reflected on this verse, you know, myself also, where, you know, sometimes when I first read this verse, I think, you know, is it just about you know, worshipping your spouse, you know, only caring about what your spouse thinks. But, you know, when I, th when I think about, one thing that made me think about as well is just sometimes in life when you try and uh, do things, it's not necessarily that you're doing things for your wife or for your family, but there, there is something else you need to consider. You know, like, let's say you, you are somebody of prominence, whether you're a successful business owner or you're a public figure, now you have more enemies. Right? And when your enemies come after you, what do they always come after? Sometimes they come after your family. You, know, you think about in you know, those Godfather movies, right? They're always like, you know, taking out each other's family and using family as collateral. So I think of those situations as well, that you know, when, when you have a fight and you have other people that you care about, they can often be used and that can change you know, how much you're willing to risk as well. Right? So family we need to be aware of that family does not overshadow and make us lose our effectiveness as soldiers of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 20 verse 8, And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Man, when I read this passage, I sometimes think, well, who is left on this battlefield? Because, I mean, everybody that goes to fight has some level of fear. So, you know, is it, is it that their fear just overcomes them, that they no longer want to be on that battlefield? But you can see how it's an important thing, that we need to be bold, we need to be courageous. I mean, in the spiritual fight, I think the fact that we are fearful and faint-hearted should not discourage us from getting out of the fight. We should say, hey, we need to overcome these fears and stay in the fight. Why? Because it says here, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So a good application of this verse is we need to think about our fears and the things that worry us, maybe what fear of what man thinks is going to impact our example and how much we can encourage others to get in this fight as well. So we need to be brave. You know, bravery and courage doesn't mean a lack of fear. It's just that we go forward even with this fear. So is this a case of you know, is the, is the fear present, therefore they should go? Or is it, hey, they're fearful, but they still want to be there? It's a test to whether or not they will stick around. But fear is something we need to be aware of as well that will change our effectiveness in this fight. Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So how do we overcome a fear of man? You know, we all experience a fear of man. It'll bring a snare to us. What is that? A trap. It stops you from doing what you otherwise ought to be able to do for the Lord. How do we overcome this? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. See, how do we overcome a fear of man? Well, we put our trust in the Lord. When we put our trust in the Lord, we'll be safe. That's one way we overcome the fear of man. What's another way to overcome fear of man? Luke 12, verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends... Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now in this context, it's obviously talking about unbelievers, right? And people should have a healthy fear of God, right? Of one reason why, why should you get saved? Well, because you, you fear the judgment, the eternal judgment, of a holy God. But if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't need to fear that. Right? So this is one way we can put this verse into, into 
need to uh, apply this verse. We don't need to have fear of man. You know, we put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't even need to fear hell. Right? So people that don't believe on Jesus Christ should have a healthy fear of hell. Right? Because it's a real thing and it's an eternal punishment. It's a terrible thing. And that will, you know, what is, going, what is one thing that is going to drive them to overcome that fear of man? Well, it's a fear of God. So how do believers apply this verse? Well, sometimes when we have a fear of man, how do we, what, what is something that can help us to overcome a fear of man? Well, if we're more concerned about what God thinks, we have a healthy fear of God and we have a healthy fear of chastisement from our loving Heavenly Father, that will help us to overcome. Hey, what can man do to us? I'd rather please God than please men. So beware of these things, right? Beware of finances, family, fear. These are things that will make you less effective as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Now the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to fighting this fight, being an effective soldier. So we want to be in the fight, right? Be in the fight. We want to be an effective soldier when we're in this fight. And one way as well, besides just being wary of the pitfalls of being an effective soldier, we want to be prepared as a soldier as well. Right? So being prepared as a soldier is not just avoiding the pitfalls. There's some work that has to be put in as well so that you are an effective at using the tools that you have in order to fight this fight. Now let's go to Ephesians 6 where we see this armour of God. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we talk about the armour of God and these things, you know, we are applying principles that we learn from God's Word, right? So God's Word is applicable in all of this, you know, because how do we have our, our loins girt about with truth? Where does truth come from? It comes from the Bible. How we have the breastplate of righteousness on. Well, where do we learn how to be righteousness? It comes from the Bible. But what you want to think about here is, as we look at this armor of God, there is both defensive equipment and offensive equipment. Right? Right now we're looking at the defensive. Loins go about with truth, like a belt. Breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. Right, so up until that point, they're all defensive. Because in a fight, you don't just learn how to attack, you need to learn how to defend as well. You know, even when you learn some self-defense, you don't only learn how to punch and kick, you need to learn how to defend from a punch and a kick. Right, you need to learn how to defend an aggressor as well as, well as you know, moves that may be aggressive as well. And it's like that in the spiritual life. You know, it's not enough just to have all the defensive equipment, to have the shield of faith, to have the helmet of salvation, to have the belt of truth and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace. Defensive is not enough. It says here in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So you can see here the spiritual fight of words, using the word of God, opening your mouth boldly, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So when I think of a physical fight and we think of defending yourself and attacking, you know, as a, as a, as a soldier, you need to know both, right? I mean, imagine if somebody only knew how to shoot a gun, but he didn't know how to avoid bullets, didn't know how to evade things, didn't know if he lost his gun, how to physically defend himself and use hand-to-hand -hand combat. You, you, you know all these things in the physical fight. How do we apply this spiritually? Well, if our sword is the Word of God, I mean, we need to know how to use it. Right? So you need to know your Bible, read your Bible. But when we think about defensively as well, we need to know how to apply the Bible. 
Right? When we think about our loins girt about with truth, on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, these are things that once we learn the Bible, we apply the Bible to our lives. We live the Bible. We walk by faith, the faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So you see, it's not enough, and we talk about this as we um, learn about growing in the Christian life. When, when Christians grow, yeah, they learn some facts. They learn knowledge. And maybe they can spit out some arguments and they can win some, some smaller arguments. But how do you defend in the Christian life? Well, defending is when you know more of the Bible. You now know how to defend those statements that you're making. Right? So you may have a position and you say, well, I believe this because the Bible teaches this. But can you defend that view? Right? Can you defend? And when people say, what about this verse? What about this verse? Do you know those verses as well? This is where you start to gird up your loins with truth, right? So you know more in order to defend yourself. But it's also applying the Word of God, right? Because your testimony has an impact on your effectiveness as well as you use the Bible. And don't we experience that in our life? I mean, somebody who is more likely to take you seriously, the words that you speak, if your testimony is more righteous, right? Even in the Bible it talks about, hey, how do wives win over their husbands? Without the word, right? It's by their conversations, by their lifestyles. You can see that the defensive equipment also makes a difference as well. So in a fight, you need to learn both how to attack and defend. And in the spiritual fight, it's about using the word of God, applying the word of God, defending the word of God. First Peter 3. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Do you see how the Bible commands us, you know, to worship the God, God with our mind? It commands us to always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks the hope that's in you. So this attitude that sometimes people have where they say, ah, oh, you know, I don't really know the Bible that well. I don't really know, like, all the complexities of it. Like, oh, I don't like getting into spiritual arguments. I just know what I believe, but that's... That is not the attitude that God wants you to have. God is saying here, you, you, sancti, you set the Lord God apart. That's what it means to sanctify in your heart. And be ready always. See, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you. So it shows that our faith should be reasonable. You know, we should be humble in how we approach things. But it says here that we should be ready always. You say, oh, well, I used to get into all these arguments and I knew all the arguments are, oh, but I've forgotten it all now. Are you keeping this verse where the Bible says be ready always to give an answer to every man? How are you going to be ready always? Well, that means you've got to be putting it into practice consistently. You know, that's why. It's maybe at the beginning when you got saved, you looked into a lot of information, you learned a lot of things, but you've forgotten it all now. That's not what God expects from us. God expects us to be ready always. And it's the same with fighting. You know, you can't just, you can't just go to one self-defense class and then think you know how to fight. You know, I mean, I, I mean I'm taking classes all the time and I'm just like off from jiu-jitsu because of the, the lockdowns. Or maybe like, you know, you can't make it to one week because you're not. And you come back and it's like, you, I've, I've, I've forgotten more moves than I remember. But you know, you know the moves that I do remember? It's the ones that get used again and again in sparring, right? So it's like, you know, sometimes when you're sparring, you default to the same moves again. It's the ones that you know. And they're the ones that you remember. They're all the ones you don't use. You know what happens? You forget those. And that's what happens in the Christian life too. That's why the Bible says we need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Otherwise, you'll be a forgetful hearer. All right? So to win a fight, you need to know how to attack and defend. What's another application to be prepared? Well, training requires hard work. So we talked about consistency, making sure you're putting into practice so that you, it, it ingrains into you. Remember, you don't forget. And it's the same when it comes to the spiritual life, right? Training requires hard work, discipline, focus. It's not going to be automatic. You're not just going to automatically know the Bible. You're not just going to automatically read your Bible. You're not just automatically going to grow in the Christian life. Growth in the Christian life requires work. It requires discipline. It requires focus. Right? Where you actually purpose in your heart to learn and to, to, to make it a point. 
It reminds me of, uh, uh, just thinking of this now, it reminds me of like just remembering people's names. You know, everyone always says, like, oh, I'm really bad at remembering names. But you know why it is? It's because people don't make it a point to remember people's names. That's why everyone's bad at remembering names, because unless you make a point to remember people's names, you don't remember them. So it's the same in anything in life. Unless you make it a point, or it's something you're doing all the time, then you're not going to remember it. So it's the same with the Bible. It's like remembering names. I try and make it a point in my life to like rem try and remember people's names. <laughs> I just think it's good for relationship building. You know, people feel special when you, you remember their name. And it's nice when you, you, know, re you, you make it a point to remember people's names. So even like at jiu-jitsu, it's the same. I'm always meeting new people. But, you know, like in class, you would just like go and shake everyone's hand. So I just make it a point to myself that when I shake everyone's hand, I try and recite their names every time. Hey, good to see you. You know, Alex, good to see you there. So, you know, it's good to, to remember. And, and, you know, don't be shy. If you don't remember somebody's name, just ask. You know, sometimes people, you know, sometimes you're in that situation where you're like, oh, man, I've known this guy for ages and I don't remember their name. I used to think like that too, but now I'm just like, I don't care anymore. If I forget their name, I'll just ask them. You know, what's the big deal? I just ask them. Remember their name. Everyone, and they've probably forgotten my name as well. So, you know, you just break the ice there. So what was my point there? It just requires focus. You've got to make it a point to learn the Word of God. If you don't, it's not automatic. And the sad thing is you may come to church for years and years and years, been a Christian for years and years and years, and yet not know much about the Bible. I mean, what a sad state of affairs. It's like, it's like being in the army. It's like you're like in the army for like decades and then you actually go and fight somebody and then you don't even know how to fight. I mean, what a, what a shame, what an embarrassment. You, know, you don't want to be like that as a Christian. But you've been a Christian for years, been a Christian for decades, and yet you don't even know how to give the gospel. You, know, you don't even know if you talk to somebody, how to explain it, you know, go to a few verses. You know, you know, at the very least, you know, that's something you should know because if you get that opportunity, what, what a... What a, what a wasted opportunity. If somebody actually asks you how to be saved and you're, oh, oh I don't know. Ah, what a sad state of affairs. You know? So you don't want to be that Christian. You want to be ready. 1 Corinthians 9, Know ye not, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. So you see how Paul is saying, hey, there's a race. Let's run like we're going to win it. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate or disciplined in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Why are you saying that athletes in this world are so disciplined, so focused, and yet they do it for something that doesn't even last for eternity? We have the opportunity to do things that do last for an eternity, and yet we, we don't have that same focus, that same discipline. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. Right? So he doesn't do it with doubt. He does it, does it with focus. So fight on, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Right? So he's saying, I'm not fighting just so I can just punch and do shadow boxing. You know, he's not, he's not fi fighting as though it's just not, not a real fight. You know, he's, he's, he's fighting, he's being serious about this. Right? So, just like in the fight, requires training, hard work, discipline, focus. And you know, like, even in physical fighting, I mean, you need to be put in uncomfortable situations. You know, and I, I just think about, I'm just applying to, like, my learning in jiu-jitsu, that, you know, if you, if, you, if you only learn how to go, you know, ya, 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 in a punching bag on pads, but you never actually put yourself in a situation where you do need to defend yourself, then how much better can you get? So it's the same in the spiritual life. You know, sometimes people are very adverse to conflict, very adverse to preaching the gospel, very adverse to talking to strangers, very adverse to just meeting new people. But that's part of the growth. You know, if you're never put in an uncomfortable situation, how do you test yourself? How do you grow? You know, like if you, it's like learning to fight and then never actually like live sparring to put yourself in that situation. Now, you don't necessarily want to be, put yourself in these street fights, but that's why they try and simulate that, right? You put yourself in these uncomfortable situations to gain experience, okay? So keep that in mind. When we think about fighting, you apply it to the spiritual life. We need training, you need focus, hard work, discipline, consistency, 
but you also need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Don't shy away from uncomfortable situations. Use those as an opportunity to flex your spiritual muscles, right? To use them and to grow as a spiritual fighter, right? Now, another application. We've just got a couple more and then we'll finish. One is, if we liken the spiritual fight to physical fighting, physical fighting can easily hurt people. And, you know, that happens, I'm applying a lot of these just in jiu-jitsu. Because what happens in jiu-jitsu, right? People think, hey, you know, oh, this person's a brown belt, a black belt, and you think like, oh man, those guys are the more dangerous ones, we got to be careful with them. But you know, it's actually the opposite. Because you know why? Because the more experienced somebody is, you know, usually your, your purples, your browns, your blacks, if you spar with them and you roll with them, they're a lot more gentle. Why? Because they've learned how to control that strength, they understand how dangerous these moves can be, they apply them a lot, you know, more subtly. You know who's dangerous in jiu-jitsu? It's, it's the 20-year-old the tough white belt that comes in and thinks he's all tough and is flailing around. They're the ones that accidentally, you know, break people's arms, accidentally jar things, you, you get elbowed in the head, you know, even though you're wrestling. It's because they're, they're, they're inexperienced. They're not careful. They don't realize, you know, that what they're doing is hurting people. Now, if that can be applied in the physical world, we need to think about that when it comes to the spiritual world. Right? What is more dangerous? The danger is the young Christian that thinks they know everything and then they go and they have a conversation with somebody and they burn all these bridges. Right? So we need to be careful. Just like you know, the new person comes to a martial arts school, you've got to be careful with them. You don't want them to get injured. Right? You don't want them to just get out because they just got injured on the first class. It's the same at church, isn't it? Younger Christians, newer Christians, people new to church, you need to be a bit more careful with them bit more delicate with your words and maybe the topics you talk about because you don't want them to just get burnt, get upset and leave like it happens in some martial arts schools. So be gentle with people. Otherwise, you can cause a lot of damage. James 3, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. So realize the danger of bad words, right? Dangerous words, right? Where words can do a lot of damage, so we need to be gentle with people, you know, and not cause a lot of damage. And the last one I just want to read here from 2 Timothy 4, and just read a couple of verses here, make one last point. 2 Timothy 4, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So he's encouraging Timothy here to, to be faithful, right? To continue preaching, right? Because we're in a spiritual war, he's preaching the word of God. For the time will come when they, when, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heed to themselves teachers, having itching ears. So you see, sometimes there's going to be good times. Sometimes there's going to be harder times. Sometimes what you preach is going to be accepted. Sometimes what you preach is not going to be accepted. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So is he saying here, hey, when things get hard, you just quit? No, he's saying be consistent, be disciplined, keep going, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So what's my point in this last passage? Is realize that the fight is not over. 
You know, it's never over until you leave this world. So we need to be fighting until the end. You know, younger people can get in the spiritual fight. Adults can get in the spiritual fight. Older people can be in the spiritual fight too. Don't think the fight is over. Fight till the end. I hope that we can all say, as Paul says here, hey, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then there will be rewards waiting for us in heaven. So in conclusion, I hope today's sermon was a blessing to you and encouragement. Hey, join the fight. Be in the fight. There is a fight going on. Don't be sleeping. Get in the fight and make sure you are a soldier for Jesus Christ. Number two is beware of things that hinder your effectiveness. Financial things. Family. Fear. Right? Don't, make, don't let those make you quit. Just be aware of them so that you can cut them out and be a more effective soldier. And lastly, prepare yourself to be the best soldier that you can be. Right? It's not going to be automatic. It's going to take work. It's going to pay, take discipline. It's going to take focus. And don't give up. Right? This fight is only just beginning. It's only just starting. Make sure you fight to the end. Right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that your perfect example, the Lord Jesus Christ, he did fight to the end. He still fights for us. We thank you for that. Help us, Lord. Give us the grace to not faint in this fight. Help us to be effective soldiers. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.